Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing prime fields. Okay, right, so what we've done so far in our construction of the prime fields is we have constructed an abelian group on which we are going to build a multiplication table and turn this abelian group into a uh, field. So we have cut up at the moment, uh, constructed z by pz, okay, which remember is this set of cosets uh, of the subgroup pz in the group of integers under addition. So we've got 0 bar, 1 bar, 2 bar, all the way up to p minus 1 bar, and we've now succeeded in defining an addition on this uh, set of symbols, which we have now proven will form an abelian group. Okay, uh, so remember addition of two cosets, the way that you do it is you quite simply take representatives from those two cosets, add those together in the old group of integers under addition, get some answer, which is an integer, and then take the coset that contains that answer, and that's your coset, which is those two original cosets added together. Okay, again, we've now proven that that will indeed obey the axioms of an obedient group. Right. What we want to do then now is we want to turn this from being an abelian group into actually being the prime field, Fp. And to do that, we need a multiplication law, okay? A second composition law. So that's where we're going now. So I want a way then of taking two arbitrary cosets, A bar and B bar, and I want to be able to multiply them together. How am I going to define this? What am I going to define A bar multiplied by B bar to actually be? Well, flushed with our success with addition, why don't we model it uh, in the image of addition? Okay, how did we add two cosets together? We took representatives, added them together in the integers, and took the coset which contained the answer. Why don't we just take two representatives, multiply them together in the integers, and that's why we discussed the fact that the integers has both addition and multiplication and forms something called a commutative ring uh, in the initial uh, part. Why don't we just do that and then take the coset that contains the answer? So let's define this to be equal to A times B, okay, where A and B are representatives of these two cosets. Okay, and one of our first challenges will be proving that this is well defined, i.e., that you can take any two representatives of these cosets. It doesn't necessarily have to be A and B, the ones after which we've named the cosets. Okay, and then we'll multiply them together in the integers and then take the coset that contains the answer. Okay, so we're going to uh, define multiplication in that way. Okay, so same protocol. We want to firstly prove it's well defined and then we want to go on to the axioms that we need that multiplication table to obey and prove that uh, this set with this multiplication table is actually going to obey those axioms. Okay, so well defined then firstly. So again, what we need to prove that uh, is that if I took any other representative of the coset A bar and any other representative of the coset B bar, multiplied these two together in the integers and took the coset that that's contained in, the answer would be the same coset as I've got here. So again, any other representative of the coset A bar looks like A plus some integer multiple of P. Okay, where z again is some integer. Okay, any coset, sorry, any other representative of the coset b bar looks like b plus again some integer multiple of p, which I'll call z prime. So here are my two other arbitrary elements of the these cosets. And now what I'm going to do is multiply together these two uh, other representatives of my cosets in the uh, integers and then show that the answer that I get will be in the same coset as A multiplied by B. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take A plus ZP, okay, and I'm going to multiply this by B plus Z prime P. Okay, and now what I'm going to do is use uh, what I know from classical algebra about uh, the algebraic structure of the integers to say, okay, I know that distributivity holds so I can multiply this out. And what I'll get is a times B, firstly, then I'll get A times Z prime P here, okay, so I'll get plus A Z prime P there, then I'll do this one times both of these, so I'll get Z P times B 
So I'll get plus Zp times B, and then I'll get these two things times together, so I'll get plus Zp Z prime P here. Okay, right. So that's the answer then to what these two things multiplied together is going to equal. Now, this is looking good because I've got the A, B out the front, which is the same answer as I got here. So if I could prove that all the rest of this was just some multiple of P, then I'd be in business, some integer multiple of P, I should say. Okay, so the first thing that I want to do is reorder this. So because of commutativity and associativity of multiplication in the integers, I can rewrite this as Z times B times P. Okay, and the reason I've done that is now all three of these have a P right at the end. So I've got a P here, a P here, and a P here. So what I'm going to do is factorize out that P uh, through reverse distributivity here. I'm going to reverse distributivity. Okay, so I have AZ prime plus ZB plus ZPZ prime times P. Okay, so as long as this is some integer, then this is an integer multiple of the prime P. Okay, now why is this thing here going to be an integer? Well, because all of these numbers are integers. A and B are integers. Z and Z prime are integers. And P is an integer. So I'm adding together lots of integers and multiplying together lots of integers. When you do that, you're still going to end up with an integer. So this thing is still, whatever it is, an integer. Okay, so indeed the answer here is still AB plus some multiple of P, and therefore it's in the same coset as A times B. So whatever two other representatives you can pick from these two cosets, the coset that the answer will be in when you multiply these two together in uh, the integers will be the same, basically. There's only one answer. So that's nice. That now proves that this multiplication is well-defined, that two different people could do it using two different representatives from these cosets, A bar and B bar, and they'd get the same answer. Okay, so now we've checked well-defined. Let's now make sure then that this multiplication law does indeed obey those six axioms that we need it to obey in order for it to be a field, and then indeed we will have a field, and this will be our prime field, Fp. Okay, right, so let's now check these axioms then. So what was axiom number one then that it needed to obey? Well, axiom number one was closure. Okay, and again, this is just obvious from the definition. This is just a tautology. Okay, so I need to make sure that whatever two cosets you take, A bar and B bar, which are elements of what I'll now call my prime field Fp, because I have now defined the multiplication on it, all we're doing now is actually proving that it is a field. Okay, um, I need to prove that when I multiply them together using this law that I've just defined, that the answer is back in Fp. Okay, and hopefully, the, again, the answer to this is pretty obvious. The way that I've defined multiplication of these two cosets, A bar and B bar, together is you take a representative from each of these, multiply them together in the integers, get some answer, which is another integer, and take the coset that contains that. Okay, all integers are contained within a coset, so the answer, whatever it is, will be another coset. You can't possibly end up with something that's not in a coset. Okay, so axiom number one, closure, we can tick off. Axiom number two, associativity, is going to follow much the same um, proof uh, as we had for addition. Okay, so we want to prove that if we have three things multiplied together, a bar multiplied by b bar multiplied by c bar, that I can put the brackets in either positions. Okay, so indeed this is going to follow the exact same proof strategy, and it's just going to be true because of associativity of multiplication in the integers. Okay, right, so we want to prove that when you multiply three things together, there is one and only one answer to that. Okay, so once again, we'll just take on each side one at a time, work them out, and show that they must be the same thing. Okay, so if we want to multiply A bar and B bar together, we take a representative from each of them, which we might as well take A and B, uh, okay, multiply them together in the integers and take the coset that contains the answer. Okay, so that's the answer to that, A times B, and then we'll multiply this 
by c bar. So again, when we want to do this, we just take a representative from each of them and multiply them together. And then take the coset that contains that. So we'll multiply a times b uh, by c and take the coset that contains that. And remember, even though I haven't got the actual symbol shown here, all of these multiplications here are now multiplications in the integers, whereas these were multiplications in the uh, field, uh, FP, the prime field. Okay, right, let's now take um, the right-hand side here. It's the same thing. We can turn B bar times C bar into B times C in the integers, bar, and then we want to multiply that by A bar, all we'll do is take a representative from here, multiply it by a representative from here, and we might as well take b times c, and then take the coset that contains that. Now, why is this thing here equal to this thing here? Because of associativity of multiplication in the integers. Okay, In the integers, a times b times c, like so, is the same as if you put the brackets like this. So these two elements are the same thing, and we're taking the cosets uh, then that contain these elements, but if they're the same element, then the coset that contains them will be exactly the same. So that means that this coset has to equal this coset, so indeed uh, multiplication of the cosets is going to be uh, associative. Okay, so much the same proof strategy as we have for addition. Okay, next up, axiom number three, so we want a multiplicative identity. Okay, so we have a multiplicative identity in the integers, and the multiplicative identity in our field uh, is just going to be the coset that contains the multiplicative identity in the integers. So the multiplicative identity in the integers is, of course, 1, so our multiplicative identity in the prime field is just going to be the coset that contains 1, 1 bar here. Okay, right. Uh, so let's just make sure that this will multiply by any other coset to give uh, the coset back again. So if we want to take one bar and we want to multiply it by a bar, okay, where a bar is an arbitrary other coset in our prime field, uh, then the way that we do this is we just pick a representative from here, pick a representative from here, multiply them together. We could pick any representative from here and any representative from here, and we know the multiplication is well defined, but the most easy one to pick is just to use 1 here. So we'll take 1, we'll multiply it by a, okay, and we'll take the coset that contains 1 times a. So now what we've done is changed this multiplication here from being multiplication in our prime field to being multiplication in the integers here, and we know that 1 times any integer will equal that other integer back again, so indeed this will equal the coset that contains a, a bar. Okay, and the argument works the same if you do it the other way around. So if you have a bar times one bar, then again this will equal a bar again because you pick a representative from here, multiply it by a representative from one bar, you'll just pick the representative one because it's the easiest one to work out. Okay, a times one will equal a, and therefore uh, we'll just have the coset that contains a as our answer. Okay, so the coset then that contains 1 is going to be our multiplicative identity in our prime field. So we do indeed have a multiplicative identity. Okay, inverses, axiom number 4, we will leave for now. We'll come back to that one. That's the least trivial, that's the most difficult one. So we'll leave that till last. Okay, so we'll skip straight on to axiom number 5, which is another nice easy one. Okay, so axiom number five is commutivity. Uh, sorry, commutativity. Um, so we need to prove that if we have any two cosets, a bar and b bar, and we multiply them together, that this will be equal to b bar times a bar. And again, this is going to follow the exact same strategy of proof as we saw for addition, proving commutativity of addition of these cosets. Okay, so quite simply, take the left-hand side here. By definition, this will be a times b in the integers, and then the left coset that contains that. The right-hand side, what we'll do is we'll multiply b times a in the integers, and we'll take the coset that contains that. But of course, a times b and b times a in the integers are equal to one another because of commutativity of multiplication of the integers, so we are asking for the coset that contains the exact same element, and therefore uh, these two cosets are going to be exactly equal to one another. So we do have commutativity of the multiplication of the cosets. 
Then axiom number six, okay, distributivity. So we want to prove that whatever cosets you take, A bar, B bar, and C bar, that A bar times B bar plus C bar is going to equal A bar times B bar plus A bar times C bar. Okay, and this is going to again work because of distributivity of multiplication over addition in the integers. Okay, and that's why these ones are all very trivial to prove because they're all true in the integers and the inverses is the least trivial to prove because that one uh, wasn't true in the integers. Okay, so we can't just uh, use the fact that it was true in the integers to prove that. We've got to have some better argument for that. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, once again, we're just going to apply the very definition to the left-hand side, apply the very definition to the right-hand side, show that they're equal to one another, and use distributivity uh, from the uh, integers uh, in the process. Okay, so the left-hand side then. So to add B bar to C bar, we know what we do. We take a representative from B bar and C bar, and we might as well take B and C, add them together in the integers, and take uh, the coset that contains it. So I'll colour that in red as usual because it's addition in the integers and this is uh, in turquoise because it's addition in our field. Okay, then what we want to do is multiply this by A bar. So again, we take a representative from here, a representative from here and multiply them together in the integers. So we'll take the representative A, we might as well take the representative B plus C, we multiply those two together in the integers and then take the coset that contains it. Okay, so here then is our overall answer to the left-hand side. Okay, take doing the right-hand side now. Uh, so if we want to multiply together A bar and B bar, we take a representative from each, multiply them together in the integers, so we'll get the coset that contains A times B. Then what we want to do is add this to A bar times C bar. Again, take a representative from each, multiply them together in the integers, so we'll get the coset that contains A times C. When we want to add these two together, take a representative from each in the integers. Again, again I'll colour that in in turquoise because that's still addition in the field. So we take a representative from each, we'll have the representative AB from here, we'll have the representative AC from here, we'll add those two together in the integers here, and we'll take the coset that contains that. Okay, so here then is the answer to the right-hand side of our equation. Now, why is it the case that these two things are equal to each other? Because a times b plus c in the integers is equal to a times b in the integers plus a times c in the integers. So these two elements in the integers are exactly equal to one another. Therefore, we're asking for the cosets that contain the same element. Okay, so these two cosets are equal to one another, and that then proves distributivity of multiplication over addition in my field. Okay, so the one last thing then that I need to show is inverses. And this is the most, uh, well, this is the most difficult, the least trivial part to show. So I think what we'll do is have a break and then we'll come back and do uh, the most difficult part.